Welcome back to Domain 5 of the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And here in Section 5.3, we'll focus on third-party risk assessment. We'll begin with a look at a number of vendor assessment techniques before we dive into considerations in selecting our vendors. We'll review an array of agreement types before we dive into a discussion of the importance of ongoing vendor monitoring. We'll touch on the value of periodic questionnaires before we wrap up with a discussion of the rules of engagement you should negotiate before signing that vendor contract. Great information for your first management role in IT. Let's dig in. Welcome back to the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And in our continuing coverage of Domain 5, we'll move on to Section 5.3, where we'll focus on third-party risk assessment and management. And here we're asked to explain the processes associated with third-party risk assessment and management. We'll review activities associated with vendor assessment, potential issues arising in vendor selection, different agreement types we might use with vendors, the importance of vendor monitoring, the value of periodic vendor questionnaires, and the all-important rules of engagement. We'll start with vendor assessment, which focuses on understanding the security posture and the risk profile of both potential and existing vendors. And there are a few common assessment methodologies, including penetration testing, so effectively simulating a cyber attack to identify vulnerabilities in the vendor systems and data security measures. And especially in the software and platform world, we'll see vendors include a right to audit clause in their proposed contract terms. So including a clause in the contract that allows our company to audit the vendor security practices at designated intervals. Another method is evidence of internal audits, so requesting proof that the vendor conducts regular internal audits of their own security controls. Independent assessments, utilizing audit reports from independent external security firms that have evaluated the vendor's security posture, exactly what we see happening with the public cloud service providers. And a method that is really top of mind in recent years, and that is supply chain analysis, so mapping your vendor ecosystem to identify potential risks introduced by their subcontractors or suppliers. In fact, let's just unpack that briefly, because today, most services are delivered through a chain of multiple entities, a supply chain. And a secure supply chain includes vendors who are secure, reliable, trustworthy, reputable. So organizations have to perform due diligence to assess their vendor security posture, their business practices, and their reliability, indeed their viability. And this may include periodic attestation requiring vendors to confirm continued implementation of security practices. As we've discussed previously, maintaining one security posture is an ongoing process, not a one-time event. And a single vulnerable vendor in the supply chain puts the organization at risk. So in addition to a vendor's Security, business practices, and reliability, I also mentioned viability, and I want to unpack that just briefly. So organizations need strong project and people management to effectively perform vendor management activities, which includes assessing vendor viability. And I mention this because viability is a process often not conducted by the security team as it deals with an operational risk, and it typically involves assessing public information on vendors like their financial statements, performance history and reputation, or even a formal report like a SOC 1, which focuses on that vendor's internal controls over financial reporting. All of these identify potential weaknesses that could impact the vendor's ability to continue operations. Remember, the third leg of the CIA triad is availability, and if we wake up one day and our cloud provider is out of business, that's going to affect availability. So let's unpack right to audit just a bit further. So with some vendors, definitely smaller vendors that don't have the ability to give us audit report on demand type attestation, a right to audit clause is an important element of our contract. So written into supply chain contracts, it allows an auditor to visit 
the premises to inspect and ensure that the contractor is complying with contractual obligations. It can help us ensure that we're getting the quality of goods we've been promised, that we're not being shorted on shipments, that there are no financial issues, no malfeasance in terms of financial transactions happening. No unnecessary services being tacked on to our contracts that's causing us additional expense. So that being said, when it comes to supply chain analysis, on-site assessment is definitely an option. Although I'd say that option is fairly rare in my experience. Document exchange and review, so to investigate data set and docs in an exchange and review process is very common. A policy or process review, where we request copies of a vendor's security policies, processes, and or procedures, and often ask them to e-sign to verify, to attest, that these policies, processes, and procedures are in place and currently in use at that organization, giving us a fair level of confidence that the vendor is secure. Third-party audits sometimes happen, so certainly when there's enough risk involved, when there's enough on the line with a mission-critical vendor, third-party audits can happen. Having an independent auditor provide an unbiased review of an entity's security infrastructure. So where we see that come into play often is in the cloud service provider space. So right to audit exists in many contracts. That right to audit a service provider certainly happens, but contracts are often written to allow your CSPs to provide their standard audits in place of a customer performed audit. I can promise you, you will never audit a big public cloud service provider like Microsoft, Amazon, or Google. You'll be using their standard third-party audits. And they're very easy to get. It only takes a second. In fact, I'm just going to show you an example of how you can retrieve an audit report on demand from a CSP. So I'll show you on the Microsoft Azure platform. The process is pretty similar for all three major CSPs. So I'm going to go to Microsoft's Service Trust portal, servicetrust.microsoft.com. I've logged in with my Azure subscriber account because some of these reports do require an NDA because they contain sensitive information. So we see ISO, I see SOC, I see GDPR. I'm going to click on SOC. We know that SOC 2 Type 2 report is kind of an industry standard. And I can scroll down here and see applicable documents. And you'll notice that they offer these reports up not just for the platform as a whole, but for specific services or components of the platform. And I can see when they were last updated. So what they'll do for a lot of these SOC 2 reports is if there hasn't been any significant change, they'll provide you a bridge letter that says, hey, there's been no change since our last audit. And you can click in there and then download that specific document. So I get to the page detail and it's a PDF and I'll click and you see here it wants to make sure I'm actually a customer so I have to sign in in order to get to that document because they're going to ask me to agree to an NDA. Now I'm not going to go any further than that because that report does contain sensitive information specific to subscribers. But point being you can go here sign in and download a SOC 2 Type 2 on demand and it solves that need without the need for the customer themselves to perform that audit. So in the vendor selection process, we have due diligence, which is the process to collect and analyze information before making a decision, signing a contract or transaction. It involves a comprehensive review of a prospective vendor's financial health, their reputation, security practices, compliance with any relevant regulations, especially if we're in a regulated industry. But due diligence doesn't stand alone. It supports the due care efforts, which are the actions taken by the organization based on their due diligence. We'll talk about due diligence and due care a bit further in this domain. So let's park that for now. The other area of potential concern is conflict of interest. We want to be certain that in selecting a vendor, there are no circumstances that may unfairly influence results in the selection process. So financial interests certainly come up. Vendor ownership, for example. If a customer employee or someone close to them has a financial stake in the vendor company, that can influence the decision-making process during vendor selection or contract negotiations. Kickbacks or bribes. 
where a vendor offers gifts, trips, or other incentives to a customer employee in exchange for preferential treatment. Uh, this could even include inflated contract prices or relaxed quality standards. In fact, with our federal government, when federal government employees attend technical conferences, the conferences have to ask attendees, are you a government employee? And if they check yes, then they're not allowed to receive gifts of any kind. And that can include all the way down to not accepting something as simple as a backpack or a t-shirt, a simple gift that they would get at the registration desk when they pick up their badge in some cases. Information sharing is another concern in the conflict of interest category. So confidentiality breaches. So for example, a vendor with access to a customer's confidential information might misuse it for their own gain or even sell it to a competitor. This could include trade secrets or sensitive customer data of any kind, really. Or unequal information sharing. So a customer might not receive all the necessary information from a vendor about their product or service limitations which potentially leads to biased decision-making or unexpected problems later because a customer signs a contract and then later discovers something they didn't know because it was withheld by the prospective vendor during negotiations. And professional relationships. So pre-existing relationships can be problematic where a customer employee has a close personal or professional relationship with a vendor representative, which can impact that person's objectivity during vendor selection or issue resolution. And then the revolving door problem, where an employee leaves their position and takes a job with a vendor they previously worked with and can create a conflict if they possess sensitive customer information or knowledge, giving them something of an insider advantage as they're negotiating their contract. Now we're going to step into agreement types. We'll start with the service level agreement, or SLA, so SLAs stipulate performance expectations like maximum downtime and often includes penalties if the vendor doesn't meet expectations, but it's generally used with vendors. So we'll sometimes see service level agreements within an organization where one department makes promises to another. We generally call those operating level agreements or OLAs. These next two agreements sound very similar in their name, but you should understand the difference between them. There's the Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, which is a formal agreement between two or more parties indicating their intention to work together toward a common goal. It's similar to an SLA in some respects, that it defines the responsibilities of each party. It is a more formal alternative to a handshake, but it lacks the binding power of a contract. It's less formal than an SLA because it typically includes no monetary penalties. And then we have the Memorandum of Agreement, or MOA, it's similar to an MOU, but it serves as a legal document and describes terms and details of the agreement. So an MOA is a legal contract, an MOU is not. That's the key difference you should take away. Next, we have the MSA, or Master Service Agreement, which provides structure to the agreements for vendors that you work with repeatedly. So the MSA is a contract with general terms between two or more parties as they enter into a service agreement. It should address compliance and process requirements the customer is passing along to the provider. The MSA should include breach notification and vendor duty to inform the customer of a breach within a specific time period after detection. So this MSA comes before a statement of work and spans projects throughout the life of the relationship. Next, we have the Statement of Work, commonly called an SOW. It's a legal document usually created after an MSA has been executed, and it governs a specific unit of work. So an MSA may document services and prices, and a SOW documents requirements, expectations, and deliverables for a project. So the MSA focus is overall and ongoing. The SOW is limited and specific. Next, we have the Non-Disclosure Agreement, or NDA, which is a contract with vendors and suppliers that prohibits disclosure of the company's confidential information. It's also used by companies to prohibit employees from sharing proprietary data. And the duration and terms may vary, so an NDA should be entered into with considerable care. Know what you're signing up for before you sign. True of any contract, really. 
And to close out agreement types, we have the Business Partners Agreement, or BPA, which is used between two companies or individuals who want to participate in a business venture to make a profit. Details will include each partner's contributions, rights, and responsibilities, details of operations, decision-making, and sharing of profits, as well as rules for the partnership ending, either at a given point based on an event or time or if one of the partners dies or moves on. Moving on to monitoring. So continuous monitoring is essential to keep track of evolving risks with our vendors. And vendor monitoring means continuous monitoring to identify the emergence of new vulnerabilities. Also remembering that the vulnerabilities of one vendor can impact the entire supply chain and validation of vendor security reduces risk. Your key takeaways being that monitoring your vendors is a continuous process and it reduces your risk. Questionnaires. So sending periodic questionnaires to vendors to gather updates on their security controls and risk management practices is really a form of self-attestation for these vendors. And it should elicit lower confidence versus an external vendor assessment. But it gives us a way to check in on the vendor to see if anything has changed since the last time we had a discussion of their security controls and their risk management practices. And finally, we have the all-important rules of engagement. So when we think about vendor monitoring and management, we want to establish clear boundaries, and we do that through rules of engagement. We want to define the purpose of any tests and what the scope will be for the people who are performing the test. We want to establish a clear agreement outlining expectations for data security, incident response, any communication protocols. It means we have a communication plan with the communication medium the audience, and the intervals. We want to ensure everyone is aware of what systems will be considered, date and time, any constraints everyone should be aware of. And it should also include clear processes for issue resolution in the event of findings or disputes. You can apply rules of engagement to a penetration test. You can apply rules of engagement to ongoing vendor monitoring of any sort. It's just good manners. And at the end of the day, if a vendor knows that they are being continuously monitored, even in a passive way, it's going to encourage good behavior and encourage compliance. All right, my friends, that does it for section 5.3. I hope you're getting value from the series. As always, if you have questions, leave them in the comments below the video. Reach out directly on LinkedIn. Happy to help anywhere I can. I'll look forward to seeing you back here in the next day or so for section 5.4. And until next time, take care and stay safe.